Great. Let's talk a little bit about income tax. And that is what we call normal tax. Now, normal tax, that is the tax that a company has to pay on its profits that it made in the year. Now, there is a difference between accounting profits, and accounting profits, as you know, is income less expenses, and taxable income. Now, taxable income is the amount that we have to calculate in order to calculate our tax liability for the year. Now, there is a difference between accounting profit and taxable income. And the reason for that is that the receiver of revenue does not always follow the same rules and the same calculations and the same methodology that we do in accounting. For tax purposes, for instance, certain income that we recognize is tax-free. Now, dividends received, for instance, is exempt from normal tax. That means that you do not pay normal tax on dividends that you receive. Now, the tax rate is 28%, not of the accounting profit, but of something that we call taxable income. So, our accounting profit is the first line item that we use in order to calculate taxable income. So, once we have <coughs> pardon me, our accounting profit for the year, we can do the necessary adjustments according to the Tax Act in order to calculate our taxable income. The receiver of revenue does not talk about depreciation. That is not a word that actually exists in his vocabulary. But he has exactly, uh, well, not exactly the same calculation, but based on the same principles as depreciation, he does the same type of calculations. He just called it wear and tear. So he calls it a wear and tear allowance, where you call it a depreciation expense in your books. Now, there is a difference between the two. The receiver of revenue has rules and regulations for every single thing under the, under the sun, and there's an exception also for every single, single thing under the sun. So although we do our depreciation calculation according to production unit method, reducing balance, whatever we use, the receiver of revenue says, I don't care what you do. I've got my own way of calculating wear and tear, which will replace your depreciation expense only in the tax calculation. So now we're in our books, we're going to record wear and tear. We are still going to record depreciation, but when we work out how much money we owe the receiver of revenue at the end of the year, we're going to take out our depreciation out of our figures, and we're going to add his wear and tear figure, which we're also going to work out, but we're going to deduct wear and tear for tax purposes only, not for accounting purposes. Expenses like fines, any type of fine that the company has received, whether it being a speeding fine, whether it's a fine for the late submission of income tax returns or VAT returns, or whatever kind of return that he was supposed to submit to the receiver of revenue, those fines is not a tax deductible expense. So he says, well, for accounting purposes, you have recognized a fine as an expense item. He says, but I'm very sorry for you. When you calculate how much money you owe me, you must add it back because I don't allow the deduction of those kind of expense items. Now, profits and losses on certain non-current assets is subject to capital gains tax. And because our wear and tear allowance is different from the figure is different from our depreciation charge, it means that for tax purposes, a non-current asset is going to have a different value as for accounting purposes. Now, you will see that that will create something that you're going to come across next year only, what we call deferred tax. So we're not going to do that this year. You must just take note of the fact that as a result of depreciation and wear and tear that's different from each other, also the carrying value of assets for accounting purposes and for tax purposes is going to be different. Now, capital gains tax is also not something that we're going to do this year. You're also going to do that next year only. But um, the, the, the basics of capital gains tax is as follows. I've already used this, uh, what do we call it, picture 
in the past where the receiver of revenue describe a tree and the fruit of the tree and it says the tree that is the capital the fruit of the tree that is the commodity that you're going to make profits with. That is what you're going to trade. And based on your trade, you're going to make an income. And that is where your profits is being generated from. He says, but this tree that actually bears the fruit. He says, this tree, that is the capital. If I'm going to sell the tree, then I'm going to make a capital gain. And based on that capital gain, I have to pay capital gains tax. Now, without thinking too much about that, we have to include 80% of the capital gain into our normal tax calculation. And then we will basically pay normal tax on 80% of the capital gain that we've made. Something, though, that you have to understand is what is provisional tax. Now, provisional tax works like this. It says, I cannot wait for you to complete your financial year and complete your figures for that financial year, and then only you're going to pay me tax, you as a company. He says, that is far too long. I want you to do, let's assume that our financial year ends 31st of December. Now, after six months, i.e. on 30 June, I want you to make an estimate of what your total taxable income for the year is going to be. Based on that taxable income for the year, you have to work out what you think your tax liability for the year is going to be. It says, and then only because six months has gone past up to the end of June, you're going to pay me half of that estimated tax liability that you have calculated for the year. You have to pay me 50% of that amount now. That is my first provisional tax payment. Then on 31st of December, come year end, I am in a much better position to know exactly what my, and to do the calculations of what my actual tax liability for the year is going to be. So I redo all my calculations. I work out my total tax liability for the year. And let's assume that I've paid him the 30th of June 20,000 rand. Come year end, I rework my tax liability and I said, well, my total tax liability for the year is going to be 80,000 Rand. So I've already paid in 20,000. So what is my liability at year end? I still have to pay him 60,000 Rand. So when I make a provisional tax payment at 30 June, what is my accounting entry? I will debit the receiver of revenues account, which is either a debtor or a creditor, and I'm going to credit bank with the amount I'm going to pay. At the end of the year, when I have reworked my whole computation and work out my actual tax liability for the year, I'm going to debit my tax expense in the income statement with a total liability for the year, and I'm going to credit the receiver of revenues account with that same amount. What is going to be the balance then in the receiver of revenues account? That will be the total tax liability for the year, less the amount that I've already paid at 30 June. So now I'm only going to settle the difference, the amount that I haven't paid him as yet. Now, most companies also, um, well, most companies, all companies have the opportunity to pay a third provisional tax payment. If they haven't paid enough tax for the first and the second um, tax payments, provisional tax payments, within a certain period of time they have to top it up and pay the third provisional tax payment if they don't want to incur interest and penalties. Now please do not confuse income tax, this is income tax, with VAT. VAT is the stuff that we've done in the first semester. VAT is input tax on uh, expenses and output tax on income. So VAT's got absolutely nothing to do with income tax, so please do not get confused. Let's do an example. Let's say that the increase in the profit before tax of the year of 100,000 rand of ABC Limited, the year in the 31 December 26, was dividends received of 8,000 rand, funds paid for the late submission of income tax returns, 2000, sorry, 2,500 rand, depreciation of 15,200 and interest on the long-term loan paid of 1,800. Now that interest, that is a tax deductible expense, so you're not going to do anything with that. 
We until for the year, so the we until allowance for the year was 19,500 rand, we caught the tax charge for the year. Provisional tax was paid on 30 June of 10,000 rand and assume a tax rate of 28%. So the first accounting entry will happen on 30 June when we paid the provisional tax. So let's have a look. On 30 June, we're going to debit the receiver of revenues account with the 10,000 rand. And we're going to credit bank with 10,000 rand. At year end, we have to determine our taxable income. Because tax is calculated not on accounting profit before tax, but on taxable income. Our starting point for this calculation, and this is only a calculation, guys. Nowhere in our books we are going to record any of this. The purpose of this calculation is to work out my total tax liability for the year, and that we will post in our books. But this in between is purely a calculation. Where does our calculation start? Our cal calculation starts with our accounting profit before tax, the 100,000. Dividends received was included in the 100,000, but dividends received is not subject to tax. So we're going to take it out of the 100,000. Then there was an expense there, which was a fine of 2,500 rand, and we are not allowed to deduct fines for tax purposes. So we're going to add back the fine of 2,500. Also included in the 100,000 rand was depreciation of 15,200, and the receiver tells us, thank you very much for your hard work, but I'm not interested in your figure. So add it back, rework everything according to my rules and regulations, and then you claim where and there. So we're going to add back our depreciation charge and we're going to claim, i.e. deduct, for tax purposes, the wear and tear allowance of 19,500. So now we have worked out a total taxable income for the year, 90,200, and based on taxable income, we are going to provide tax of 28%, which is 25,256. So now in our statement of Profit or loss and other comprehensive income. We would have had profit before tax of 100,000 rand. That didn't change. And then on our taxation line, that would be our total tax liability for the year 25 to 56. So profit after tax 74,744. And then we would have had other comprehensive income in order to derive a total comprehensive income. Great. So what is our next accounting entry? Our next accounting entry is to account for our total tax liability for the year, for the 25 to 56 on 31 December. We're going to debit our expense account, 25 to 56. So there you can see our expense account, 25256, and credit the receiver of revenue with 25256. We owe for the full year an amount of 25 to 56. We have already paid him in June 10,000 rand. So how much money do we still owe him? We still owe him an amount of 10,000 rand. So we're going to debit the receiver of revenues account with 15,256 and we're going to credit bank 15,256. And then you will see that we have settled the whole outstanding amount of 25,256. Now, there's something that is different from income tax. It is different from base you earn. It is different from that. And that is something that we call dividend withholding tax. Now, that is a tax that the shareholders pay to the receiver of revenue based on the dividend that they're going to receive from the company. But in a sense, it's also like pay as you earn. Although the shareholder is responsible for paying the 20% tax on the dividend that they're going to receive, the company administers this payment on their behalf. So once a company has declared a dividend, let's say the company declares a dividend of 100,000 Rand, what the company needs to do is to hold back 20% of that dividend and pay that over to the receiver of revenue on behalf of the shareholder. So what the company will do is if you declare a dividend of 100,000 rand, it's going to pay the shareholders 80,000 rand and it's going to pay SARS for dividend withholding tax 20,000 rand. So at the end of the day, what is our accounting entry? We're going to debit dividends, 
100,000 because that is the dividend declared by the company. We're going to credit shareholders for dividends with 80,000. We're going to credit sales dividend withholding tax with 20,000. A separate source account. For every type of tax, you must have their own source account. When we then pay the dividend, what are we going to do? We're going to debit shareholders for dividends, 80,000. We're going to debit source for dividend withholding tax, 20,000. And we're going to credit bank with 100,000. So you can see the dividend was declared for 100,000. We pay out at the end of the day 100,000. We just pay to do two different parties. Now, South African resident companies and foreign companies are exempt from this 20% withholding tax. Foreign companies, uh, there's actually a, a formula that you have to apply for foreign companies. It's not exactly 20%, but it's more or less 20%. So for our purposes and for this year only, we will assume that foreign companies is also totally exempt for dividend withholding tax. So let's do an example. On 31 December 27, ABC Limited declares a dividend of 30,000 Rand. 40% of the company shareholders are South African resident companies and 20% of the shareholders are foreign companies. So how much of that dividend is not sub subject to dividend withholding tax? It will be the 40% plus the 20%, so 60% of that dividend declared is not subject to dividend withholding tax. So it is only the remaining 40% which is paid to with individuals that will be subject to dividend withholding tax. And you have to prepare the, the, the accounting entries, the journal entries. Now the dividend that was declared was 30,000 rand. So I'm going to debit dividends 30,000 rand and at the end of the year I'm going to close this dividends off against retained earnings. My source tax liability for dividend withholding tax is going to be the remaining 40% multiplied by 30,000 multiplied by 20%, the 20% withholding tax. So the 40%, which is 100, less the 40% of companies, which is exempt, less 20% of foreigners that is exempt, which gives us a remaining 40%. And that gives us total amount of dividend withholding tax of 2,400. The balancing figure there is 27,600. And that is the amount that we're going to pay out eventually to the shareholders. Directly into their pockets, 27,600. So when payment tax plus, what are we going to do? We're going to debit share shareholders for dividends, 27,600. We're going to debit source, 2,400. And we're going to credit bank with 30,000 rand. Reserves. Now we've seen that reserves is that is profits which we haven't distributed to the shareholders and that's like retained income. So retained income, we haven't actually distributed that to our uh, shareholders, to the capital and equity holders and that becomes then part of equity. The remuneration surplus on property, plant and equipment, that is also part of equity and there is a separate category for revaluation surpluses which we have to show separately on the statement of changes in equity. Now in our income statement we have net profit after tax and net profit after tax will increase my retained income. And then we have other comprehensive income and under that we're going to show revaluation surplus and that revaluation surplus which we're going to show there is going to increase our revaluation surplus on our statement of changes in equity. So this is what our statement in changes in equity looks like. We have a proper heading, statement of changes in equity for the year ended 31 December 28. For every type of equity item we're going to have its own column and all the movements which took place during the year in that line item of equity needs to be disclosed in the statement of changes in equity. So here we have an opening balance in the beginning of the year, 21.5 million ordinary share capital, 3 million preference share capital. We had an, a revaluation surplus already in the beginning of the year of 800,000. We had retained earnings at the beginning of the year of 12.3 million and our total equity in the beginning of the year was 37,600. If we look at ordinary share capital, we have issued new ordinary shares of 10.7 million 
and we had shear issue costs which we've written off against that. So you see here it's a separate line item of 300,000. So at the end of the year, ordinary share capital was equal to 31.9 million. There was no changes in our preference share capital this year. Our revaluation surplus, our other comprehensive income was 400,000 rand for this year, which brings our total revaluation surplus to 1.2 million rand at the end of the year. Our retained profit started off with an opening balance of 12.3 million, and our net profit after tax was 8.9 million, which increased our retained earnings. The 8.9 million net profit after tax plus the 400,000 revaluation surplus for the current year, those two makes up my total comprehensive income in my income statement of 9.3 million rand. Then. So my total comprehensive income would have been 9.3 million split into two lines. 8.9 million, i.e. net profit after tax, will go to retained profit, and the revaluation surplus of 400,000 will go to my revaluation surplus column. Then the only thing that reduces our retained profit for the year was dividends, which we have declared. So dividends declared will reduce our retained profit. So at the end of the year, we had 31.9 million order share capital, 3 million preference capital, a revaluation surplus of 1.2 million, and retained profit of 17.9 million. So total equity at the end of the year, 54 million. In our statement of financial position, we're going to show under the equity section order share capital with the amount. Reference share capital with the amount, revaluation surplus with the amount, retained profit with the amount, and total equity. So these headings will be all line items on the statement of financial position with a total equity value of 54 million rand. And that is companies.